Okay, yeah, so I'm ready for the whole chapter. Uh, but how long this takes depends on how much we want to talk about things. Because I didn't prepare super detailed slides, and I kind of, as usual, pick and choose what I care to talk about. So if I missed the thing that really jumped out at you at the chapter, you know, like raise your hand and we'll, you know, we can talk about it. Okay, let's see. All right, so here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Can you uh, go ahead and maximize that. Let's see. And maybe zoom in a little if you can, just for those watching. I'm not as familiar with the zoom controls okay. for this. So let me see. If, if you can't get to work, just open in browser. Yeah. Okay. Is this? Oops. There you go, yeah. Is that look any better? Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, that looks great. All right. So, yeah, the learning objectives, I think, are just identifying. There's, there are four main algorithms that are covered in this chapter. These are not by any stretch the only four. I'm not sure why they picked these four, except this is a, a good representation of I think the current state of a lot of this category of machine learning. So yeah, K nearest neighbors, tree models, bagging in the random forest, and then boosting are kind of the, the four things that this chapter covers. And that's what this, you know, these slides are organized around to have basically one section for each. Uh, before we jump into those, I like to do a little bit of semi-philosophical musing here. You know, the chapter is called Statistical Machine Learning, and the, the book doesn't like, explain a whole lot what it means by that phrase. It seems to be contrasting statistical machine learning with other statistical methods that we've covered in the book. But as it says, it's a really, really great area. The last chapter, we talked about classification. And a, a lot of what was discussed in the last chapter was basically statistical machine learning. So, you know, there's, there's not a very bright line there. I think that maybe the methods of statistical machine learning Statistical in contrast with like the deep learning, machine learning, maybe, maybe that's like, yes, they're not talking about neural nets or anything here. So maybe that's the, the, the contrast of drawing. I don't know. But you know, I was thinking about this and I'm not want to get too far um, on down a rabbit trail here. But, you know, we talk, when doing it's statistics and machine learning, we talk about inference which is in general is reasoning from some facts to other facts. And I was thinking statistics in contrast to math, sort of like, I mean, statistics involves math, but most of mathematics is like a, a deductive inference. You know, what you, the conclusions you draw in math, like when you do mathematical proofs are certain, but statistics involves inductive inference. You know, it's probabilistic reasoning. We go from certain facts to other facts, uh, probabilistically, you know, it's, it's inference. I mean, we're not, the conclusions you draw when you, uh, you know, fit a model and, and run that model are never 100% certain. So that's what, most of statistics and maybe all of statistics is really inductive in nature in that sense. But machine learning at least is explicitly inductive. You know, that's, that is what machine learning is. We start with sp specific facts, like examples, particular examples in our data. And then what we do is we derive a general model to draw general conclusions that we can then apply to new cases. So that's explicitly 
inductive. So for me, it was helpful to kind of think about, you know, this is how, this is what statistics is. This is what machine learning is in general, explicitly inductive uh, inference. The, the terminology that's used here is, is established or, or covered way back in chapter one. Uh, machine learning is inductive reasoning from, let's say we have a, you know, some data and the, the aspects of those data that we want to predict on and we call the features and the part of the data that we want to predict to, we'll call the target. There's lots of different alternative terminology that's used in this case, but I sort of flipped a coin and picked features and target. I don't know if I'll be using those much much what it happens, but you know, that's uh, just some common terminology. So machine learning is we, you know, we have some features of some data, we want to predict you know, the target column of that, that data, I think the data frame. Okay, so the first kind of model that was covered in this book is the K nearest neighbors model. And in some ways this is like the simplest application of the inductive reasoning principle we just talked about. You know, the, the simplest way to, to reason is just assume that examples that have similar features will also have similar targets. So things that are similar in certain ways will be similar in other ways is, the, is one way of, of phrasing this, this assumption. In some ways, this like that assumption is behind all of machine learning and all of statistics, right? So it's, it's, a, it's not a new assumption, but K nearest neighbors takes that assumption and just sort of makes that, well, that's just the basis of our model. So if we want to find out, if I have a, a new example data, I want to predict its target. Well, I find examples that have similar features to this example, with the neighbors, and I, I use their targets to predict the, the new target. So if I, I have known examples, and I have a new piece of information coming in, new data coming in, then KNN just says, okay, let me find the examples that most closely match my new example. Those are the neighbors. And I'll take the targets for those known examples and assume that those are, that will be the target for the, the new case. There's, you know, it, it can be stated kind of simply, but there's, some things you have to be careful about actually implementing it. I mean, one, one thing that amused me, if you, if you look at the book and they have a, a graphical example of this, you know, they have like a, a two dimensional feature space and a whole bunch of examples scattered around and you put a new example in the middle, you draw a circle radius around, like here's the nearest neighbors to our new example. Uh, what, are the, what are the target classes for those neighbors? And in the example they give, like I can't tell at a glance whether there's more circles or squares, <laughs> right? You know, the, the neighbors for that, in that particular case are not homogeneous. They don't all have the same target classification, which is kind of funny because you look at that and it almost like breaks the assumption. Like, no, clearly examples that are similar in these ways aren't similar in their classification. So like right there, you see, some of the shortcomings of this assumption is that sometimes it's just wrong. You know, they, examples that can be close together, at least in the feature space you've identified, are not necessarily close together uh, in other important ways. But I mean, it's that's just the, the example they used. Uh, and, and again, that highlights that inductive inference is not 100%, right? It's probabilistic in nature and if you find that half of your neighbors are in one class and half are in the other, then sort of the best you can say is, I don't know, like it's a, it's a coin toss. Yeah, I kind of, yeah. I, I wonder if they engineered this so they could do their example of, oh, by the way, technically this is giving you a probability. And in that case, it was, you know, 0.55 basically. <laughs> I, mean, <But laughs> I, I doubt they like engineer it specifically is like, it's almost harder to find them. Right. Like, yeah. At least for the data sets they've been using, it seems really kind of. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they were, they were 
they're using just two features out of this data set. And that's part of the problem yeah. that making it visible to a human brain <laughs> makes it not that useful. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe. <laughs> my, my, my sense of the book overall, as much as I like it, is they're, they're not particularly pedagogically like thoughtful. So yeah. I don't know whether right, they right. did that on purpose or not. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay, but so what we just described though, you know, this process of you take some of the nearest neighbors and you know you use those neighbors to to make the predictions you care about. We have to define a few things more carefully, like, well, how many neighbors are we going to take? If I take too few neighbors, so I look in just, just the immediate neighborhood of my new data, then I run the risk of overfitting. That's you know being too sensitive to the details and the fluctuations of my example data set. You know, like if you if you take that picture in the book, which I don't know, hope hope you have in front of you, but it, you know it's it's this two dimensional um, you know, feature space with squares and rectangles or squares and uh, and circles sort of mixed throughout. And you take uh, let's let's say you take a single neighbor. Uh, you know, you're, if your new case happens to be just closer to a circle, then it'll be a circle. If it's moved over a little bit closer to a square, it'll be a square. You're like, so you're, you're, the way you classify new examples would be very uh, noisy and overfit if you take a, just a single neighbor, for example. Because then it's just random luck which one you happen to be a little bit closer to. On the other hand, if you take too many neighbors, you're going to underfit or as the book says, over smooth your data. So if, let's, say, let's say you have such a large neighborhood that all your whole example set is included in your neighborhood every time. Then what you predict every time is just the, the class average. Right? Oh, it's always going to be, make up the numbers here, 60% like circle and 40% square, you know, or whatever it is, I made that up. And that's just like kind of fitting the average, just like your, your, your model is just taking the mean. And so for this model, you know, one of the crucial things is how many neighbors are you, are you taking? And that's the parameter that, that you dial between overfitting and underfitting. That's what's the size of that neighborhood that you take. But yeah, you can't even really define a neighborhood very well without talking about how you measure closeness. You know, if you have a single feature that you're measuring closeness on, yeah, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. If it's, you know, if it's a numerical feature, you, closeness is just how far away the numbers are. But if you have more than one feature, let's say you have two numerical features. Uh, one is, I'm gonna make up a data set here. One is the height of a person in feet and the other is the weight of a person in pounds. People tend to be a relatively small number of feet tall, you know, five or six, and a relatively large number of pounds, you know, a hundred or more. And so if, if I'm naive about my numerical neighborhood here, then, you know, two people who are like say three pounds apart, say 140 pounds, 143 pounds, the distance between them in that sense will almost certainly overwhelm whatever distance between them in height there is, because they're probably not three feet different in height, right? But now let's, and here's one way of understanding why this is a problem, right? Let's suppose that the exact same data set is used by uh, somebody who likes to work in centimeters for height and stones per, per pound for weight, right? People tend to be a small number of stones apart if I'm measuring weight in stones, but a large number of centimeters apart if I'm measuring um, you know, height in centimeters. So the same people, the same two people that in my data set were close together in height and far, far apart in weight, well, they'll be close together in weight and far apart in height if I just use different units. Like, so that, that illustrates that you can't just naively take the numerical values of your features and like calculated distance from them. So you have to use a distance metric, which 
mean, basically means you're weighting the different features, the different the numerical or categorical features you have to say how important these are in determining distance. And usually a good thing to do, even you know, before you pick a metric, is you normalize the variables. So you're not just taking, say, my height in centimeters or my height in feet. What you want to do is my height in standard deviations from the norm or from the mean. And that's something that would be independent of the units I use, and you know, independent of the particular uh, scale of the numerical space. So, so yeah, normalize your variables, pick a distance metric that defines how close two examples are. And then once you have that, you have to pick how many examples to take in your neighborhood. And that right there, that will define your KNN model. Hey, I have a really stupid question. Yeah. Um, can you use KNN with some kind of a dimensionality reduction or does it not work? I think so. I mean, like what you're saying is you have, let's say a high dimensional data set. And before you do KNN, can you apply like, um, like PC component yeah. reduction on that? I think so. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't see any reason why you can't. Yeah, it should work. If, if your PCA works, then... Yeah. That might be I... a good thing to do, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, th this definitely, like, this is a high-level... Well, they, like, do a deep dive into a few high-level topics, it seems mm -hmm. like, here. And so, definitely, this isn't the book to learn every, like, how to really apply KNN. Um, that's probably ISLR that we'll be doing a book club of soon. Um, but it's, uh, it is, you know, it's interesting to think about all these, all the things around it. Yes. Now I like sort of thinking about tree models, which is the next kind of model. Uh, we'll uh, compare and contrast this to KNN. A tree model is a decision tree, basically, right? And it's one of the nice thing about a tree model is that it's, it kind of mimics the way in which humans might think about a model. And so I have, uh, you know, some data set that I want to classify. And I, like for a human, if I have a set of rules, okay, okay, first look at how, you know, let's say that's our data set, is about the height and weight. First look at the height of person, if it falls, you know, in this category, take this branch of the tree. If it falls in that category, take the next branch of the tree. Okay, now look at the weight of the person. If it falls in this category, take this, you know, and so it's a set of sequential rules that you know, humans naturally you know, think about it this way. So a decision tree is a nice way to build a model that can be intuitively understood by humans. And it's because of that, it's relatively transparent. You, know, you understand how the model works. So the model is just going through this decision tree. At each point, it makes a decision and takes a different branch of the tree. It's relatively easy to understand how the decision rules were obtained when you fit the model. And, and the book covers this, so I won't, won't try to go there. And the rules themselves, at least on some level, are interpretable. You know, the, the model says, if your credit score is above this level, then you know, take this branch. And if your credit score is below this level, take this branch. And you can say, you know, the model thinks that your credit score is a predictive feature here. You know, higher credit score means more likely to go this. Like it's, it's explicitly in the model that you know, each, how each feature um, influences the model's classification. I say at least superficially because you know, if you get too big a decision tree and it overfits, as I have right down there below, you know, then the rules start to become arbitrary and capricious. Like if you have a credit score in this tiny range and you, like, and you start to pile on all these really detailed rules going down the tree 10 layers, then I mean, it becomes harder to interpret the rules and they really become less meaningful. 
so that kind of leads to the idea of like, how big do you let the tree grow? Because you, what you can do, if you have enough features, you know, enough places to split on, is you can, you can keep adding decision nodes to your tree saying, okay, now let's, now that, now that we know your credit scores in this narrow range and that you've been working for this particular period of time, you know, you know, all these things, now is your name Fred, right? Like you can, you can, you can split until you get down to a single example, a single, a single example in your leaf node at the end of your tree. Like, okay. Um, I think to use an example that I think was used last time, like if you're, well, you're a Hispanic male with a relatively high income in this particular neighborhood, if you didn't vote in the last, you know, and you, you have all these, these narrow things. Oh, and then look, we have only one example in this, in this leaf. You know, and that's, that's, that's overfitting, right? The tree has grown too big and too detailed such that uh, we go down to the individual example level. So if I let my tree grow too big, have too many branchings, then I will tend to overfit my data. I'm dividing my, my feature space into too, too many tiny neighborhoods. If I don't let my tree grow big enough, then I, I underfit. If I just have, say, one branching, uh, you know, oh, what's your credit score? <laughs> and okay, then you, if it's below this, then you default. If it's above this, you don't default and alone, whatever it is. And so kind of like with KNN and almost every model, you know, you're trying to dial a parameter between overfitting and underfitting to get the optimal model you can. Uh, for, for tree models, that parameter is roughly like, how big do I let my tree get? How many, how many layers deep? So I like to think about a tree model in contrast to, to the nearest neighbors. KNN always takes the K nearest neighbors of a new example. So like if K is 10, then KNN will always take the 10 nearest neighbors. Uh, a decision tree, rather than always saying, look at your 10 nearest neighbors, it divides the feature space into fixed neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods may be big or small. They may have more or fewer examples in them. But once you train your tree model, those neighborhoods are fixed. And so new examples, you find what neighborhood they're in, and then you just compare them to the neighbors in that neighborhood. So it's not just like pick the neighbors by distance, it's pick the neighbors by neighborhood. And Jonathan, just going, thinking about it, going back to what you said at the beginning that, that this whole process is necessarily um, somewhat ambiguous and like, I, I feel like uh, it would be easy to get to a point where you are fitting and you're fitting and you're fitting to the point where it, it predicts the outcomes like 100% of the time. And then everybody high fives and says, Oh, we are, our model's perfect. And then, you know, you go on. Um, so it almost seems like a hundred percent prediction it means you've gone too far and you need to back it off a little bit to where there is, where it's not a hundred percent. And that's more. Yeah. And, and that's actually, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really good point because that is overfitting. If you get to a place where you classify things a hundred percent in your training set and like, well, and you still, you need some sort of validation set to exactly. know because it's, possible you're actually capturing every rule that defines the answer you know if you think of like science you know like if you're trying to predict what time is the sun going to rise and you have basically what time did the sun rise yesterday i think is probably all you really need um and so you could get a hundred percent prediction you could get a model that's always right because it's actually right like <laughs> it's it is the true model um, but in, you know, in most cases that you're actually going to bother building a model for, you probably won't get to that point. So I, I'm just saying, yes, you're right most of the time, but you had a hundred percent model. And so we had to back off a little bit because it wasn't. <laughs> well, and, and you got to be clear, a hundred percent model. Like yeah. if you mean a hundred percent on your training set, that's almost certainly because yeah. it's over for me. But at the same time, you should always, always, always be testing your models 
on data that was not included in the training. You know, so say how it actually does on new data. And if your model does 100% on that and there's no funny business and everything's about board, like that's a really good model. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's probably unheard of that it actually gets 100%, as John was saying. Like that's really rare that you have a perfect... And it's, it is weird enough new data. that I would say, you know, at that point, I would still be like, well, like there's data leakage. There's something wrong where... Yeah, somehow was, my model's cheating accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So when you, yeah. when you talk about a 100% model, kind of got to be clear, you know, it's easy to make a model that is 100% or near that on a training, training set. In fact, if I, have, if I have enough features, then a tree model trained long enough, trained big enough, will get to 100%. You know, I say I have enough features because if I only have one feature to split on, then my tree can't grow any further. But if I have a large, you know, I, have, I collect a lot of demographic data that's meaningless and irrelevant, then, you know, I can get a tree model that'll get 100% on, on a training set. And the same thing for KNN. I can get a, I mean, a KNN doesn't really have training in that way. It's sort of by, by definition, It'll, it'll get 100% on itself <laughs> if you have a small enough neighborhood. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you, you, you got to avoid fooling yourself by always having a, a test set. Okay, so KNN and tree models are the two kind of architectures that the book considers. And then the next two topics, uh, bagging and boosting, uh, like ways of building better models with this. So bagging in particular, uh, actually for both of these methods, the, the basic idea is that a group of models or an ensemble of models is almost always better than a single model. And they give the example of, you know, if I have lots of different people guessing the weight of a cow and I average their guesses together, then you know, the average generally does better than on average an individual guess, right? You know, they, they give a, an example about like guessing the weight of an ox at a fair or something like that. <clears throat> so you, if you can build an ensemble of models, then it's usually a good thing to do. And there's a couple different ways you could do this. You could build different kinds of models on the same data. So I might, you know, build a KNN model on my data and also a decision tree model on my data. And let's say pick some other things that the book didn't cover. Right? I'd build different kinds of models in the same data. And sometimes that's a really good thing to do if you can do it, because if I have really different approaches to building models, then the models will pick out different, you know, aspects of the situation. But this is also kind of hard to scale. If I want to add a new model to my ensemble, I got to develop it. You know, I have to do the training and development for that, that particular model. A different way to make an ensemble or something like an ensemble is to train the same kind of model, but just lots of them. Now I can't just train the same kind of model on the same kind of training data, or I'm just getting the exact same, my, my, my ensemble is full of clones and that doesn't do me any good at all. So to get a different models, we need different sets of training data. So as I might train my tree model on, I'm, I'm training a bunch of tree models, but to get make sure they're different, I have to give them different sets of data. How do we get different sets of data? And this is a throwback to some earlier chapters. We use bootstrap, <laughs> right? We, we take my, our initial training set and we make a whole bunch of new training sets from it just by sampling it. So I draw, let's say I have a, a set of a thousand examples. That's my training set. Let me make a new training set by randomly drawing a thousand with replacement from that original set. And I can do that as many times as I want. And so I can gen generate an arbitrarily large bootstrap set of training sets. And each of those can get can get a model trained and they'll be slightly different because they're trained on slightly different uh, training data. And then that whole model is a bagged model. 
I think bagging is called bootstrap aggregating, but I think of it as like an actual bag full of, full of models. You can bag any model type, as far as I know, maybe uh, like thinking about K and N would be a little weird. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think, I think I can confidently say any model type that has a training set can be bagged. <laughs> right. When you bag a tree in particular, a tree model, there's usually an extra step in addition to just bagging. So you can just bag a tree model like anything else, but there's an extra step that's often performed. And the book doesn't explain why this, but I think it's probably, there's good reasons for it. In addition to training a new tree model, each tree model on a different random bootstrap training set, you also, for each tree model, pick only a random subset of the features to consider. So let's say I have a, a feature set, there's a hundred different features and I have a large set of training examples. If I'm bagging my tree model for each tree, I'll only say, oh, let me randomly pick 10 features to build a tree model on this. So you kind of think that each tree sort of randomly has only access to not only a, sub, not only a subset of the training data, or, but also as just a subset of the, the features. So if you think of your training data as like a big table, uh, you have, by bootstrapping, you're randomly picking rows of that table to, to be your new training set, but you're also randomly picking columns of that table to use. So doing this is with a tree model is called the random forest, which is apparently a trademark term, but it's used in a very generic sense because that's what it means. You're training tree models on subsets, or bootstrap subsets of your your rows, and then uh, just random subsets of your columns. And you train lots of those, and that becomes your ensemble. <clears throat> a random forest loses some of the benefits of an individual tree. It's harder to say, oh, here is what the model does with this feature, because different trees in your forest might do different things with that feature, right? So it's not like you can, you can say, it's not quite as interpretable, but you can still, judge the relative importance of different features that your model uses. Like, you know, on average in my forest of tree models, this feature is used, you know, this often with uh, this increase in node purity. Uh, the book covers a few different ways of estimating the importance of a feature. Won't go into that any further unless somebody wants to. But you can, you can imagine, you have sort of a bunch of trees in the forest and Oh, hey, most of the trees split on credit score in this way. And so that lets you estimate the importance of that feature relative to other features. All right, so bagging is one way of making an ensemble of models. Boosting is another way of making an ensemble or something like an ensemble. Okay, just remember, an ensemble means we don't just have a single model, we have a bunch of models, and we take the prediction from each of the individual models, and together we use that to make a decision. It's like having a committee rather than just a single person. So the ensemble that we get from boosting is a, it's a more intentionally made ensemble. Uh, but maybe that doesn't work for you. It's, but the idea is, as I'm building up my ensembles, not just I'm saying, okay, train a model, train a model, train a model, train a model, now they all come together and here's the ensemble. It's more like this, I train a model and I look at it and I say, okay, where is this model deficient? Let me train another model specifically to overcome those deficiencies. So I train another model. Okay, where is that model deficient? Let me train another model to overcome those deficiencies. So it's, it's not just sort of a, a blind committee, you know, a jury that's randomly selected from, you know, the population. But with each new model that we build, we pick the next model specifically to overcome the shortcomings of the previous one. I confess that the description in the book, I like, didn't help me a whole lot. And frustratingly, there was a typo at a crucial point when I was like really trying to understand, like, how could this work? 
And so I, I finally looked at a, 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 another reference and I found you know, a, a correct expression, the correct equation um, and some nice pictures. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you some pictures in the next slide in a minute. But the, in the book, they go over one of the boosting algorithms, eta boost, I think there's a, there's a few different boosting type algorithms. The basic idea it says behind all of them is you have your training examples that are weighted. So you start out with all training examples have the, the same weight, but then as you train a model, the examples that get misclassified by that model get a higher weight for the next round. And there's a nice uh, graphical example of this at that URL. So let's suppose I have some data here that I want to classify as yellow and purple. And I have two features, X and Y. And, and for now, let's suppose I'm fitting decision trees and each decision tree can only branch once. So it's like I can either you know, do a, draw a horizontal line or a vertical line. I'm, I'm gathering that just from the pictures that as the kind of models we build. All right, so my, my first tiny tree, <clears throat> it might draw a line somewhere here on the, let's say the X equals zero line. That roughly splits things into purple on the left and yellow on the right, but not perfectly because you see there is some yellow on the left and purple on the right. So for the next round, we take those that were misclassified and we increase their weight. And so you see here in this row, you know, there are certain yellow circles that are bigger and certain purple circles that are bigger. Those are the ones that were misclassified the first round. So for the next round, those get extra weight. So that model is like, hey, gotta be extra careful. Try not to misclassify these examples. And so a model that you train on that might draw a line here around just a little below y equals two. <clears throat> this way it avoids misclassifying these, uh, all these big purple circles and at least two of these big yellow circles. Now this still misclassifies this third yellow circle here. So in the next panel, that one, that yellow circle gets even bigger, right? And as well as all these yellows that are here in the bottom, they get a little bit bigger. Okay, so you see then in the next, for the next set here, we have uh, some of the yellow circles are kind of a little bit bigger, some are a lot bigger. So the model that we build on those is trying extra hard not to misclassify those. And so it might, you know, put, say, well, break, draw the line at X equals around negative one or something. And then you can keep going. And then there's, there's certain purples that are misclassified here. And so those get bigger. And, you, and so you draw another classifier that tries really hard not to misclassify the, the examples with, with the new weights. And if you do this, <clears throat> you can do this, you know, for as many rounds as you want. And then your final model is taken by averaging the predictions of all these together with these weights. So like in this case, the ensemble you get might have this prediction space, uh, which is near the brown area. And what's interesting about this is it's no longer just like a, a, single, a single line in the X or Y direction because you're combining lots of different splits. It's like you're combining you know, a, a tree that splits this way, the tree that splits that way. And so you can, you can draw more complex shapes in your feature space because it's an ensemble, that's the whole point. Okay, so I found this picture a lot more helpful and intuitive than trying to read the words in the book. But I think the idea makes a lot of sense. You know, you're building an ensemble but you're doing it in an intentional way, picking your next model to specifically you know, overcome the misclassifications of the previous model. Boosting is really powerful and makes a lot of sense, uh, but as the book warns, it's a, it's a very touchy kind of model. It's very easy to overfit. You know, I, you can imagine as if I'm willing to go 
to you know, as many iterations of this boosting as I want, I'll eventually get to a model that perfectly classifies all the training examples because it's, it's you know, going back and forth. Each, each new level, it's like, well, I want to classify this example, but I want to classify this. And you keep going down to eventually classifying all the training examples correctly. And that's overfitting, almost certainly, right? So you know, there, are, there are ways to overfit, I, will, I mean, to avoid overfitting. Um, I won't, I don't have in my slides any more detail about this, but the general idea is you can regularize your models by adding a penalty that goes with complexity. And we talked about this way back earlier in the book. You know, in general, uh, more complex models will do better at classifying your training examples, but more complex models are often undesirable for a lot of reasons because they can overfit. And so if you add a penalty to your complex models, a penalty that, you know, a penalty on the complexity of your models, then you can avoid overfitting. You know, the, the, the penalty might be, you know, for every new feature or every new the level that we go you know, at, a, at a penalty of some kind. <clears throat> And so you, you cut off your, your boosting process before you get too far down. And that is the anticlimactic end of my slides here. <laughs> uh, yeah, anything that I, I glossed over or, or didn't get to that jumped out at you? Let me see. I just, the thing okay. that, um, that really kind of cracks me up is that random forest is a um, trademarked term. Um, I went and looked it up. It was, it's only as of 2006 that they trademarked it. And it looks like it's on like a specific type of random forest. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's funny to me. Like you, you missed like that, that, you did not protect that copyright very well. But I mean, I, I like, that's good. <laughs> If oh they, yeah, yeah. If they were jerks. They were about trying. It and, like pinged I, everybody, pinged everyone that, that used the term. That'd be annoying. I, I think they were trying to, but it had already gotten out too far by the time they trademarked it. Yeah. So they're like, <laughs> not going to work. Um. So yeah, I just thought that was funny because it, it 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 actually it made me like stop and think about it. Like it had gotten to the point in my head that random forest just logically means a bunch of tree models and it's like oh wait no it's like a pun and you know it's not really like it's not literally a random forest you know but it it works so well as a name for a bunch of trees um, yeah i mean can you come up with a better description like it's no a bagged tree <laughs> models so <laughs> would be what we had without random forest bag tree models with taking a subset of your feature space. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. And do it's such know, a natural extension of bagging to do with that. It's, you know, I think. Do you know, is there any other boosting? Like boosting of non-tree models? Yes. Yes. I mean, um, I, the, the, so a couple things. The boosting algorithm that is described here doesn't have to be used to the tree model, right? Right. I mean, I, I'm interpreting the pictures here as if they're very simple trees just because of, of how they look. But the process of saying you fit a model and examples that are misclassified, you know, increase the weight and fit another model. You can do that process with like any kind of model. It doesn't have to be a tree. And there are other variations on the boosting algorithm. Like this is Ada boost in particular, and that's the, the boosting algorithm that the book go, you know, covers in a bit more detail. If you're doing, I mean, you can imagine like this Ada boost makes sense for classification because you say, oh, this is misclassified, you know, increase the weight. But if you're doing a kind of regression, 
then you have to tweak the, the algorithm a little bit because it's no longer about being like, classified right or wrong. Now it's about like how close numerically did you get to a target? And so you now it's about residuals rather than misclassification. I am not familiar or prepared to, you know, to go into the differences between them because to me, conceptually, it's like, oh, what it's basically doing is trying to overcome the limitations of the previous model, whether that's increase the weight of misclassified examples or to fit a model on the residuals, you know, to right. basically counter those. There's probably at this point, like a dozen variations and implementations of, of, of flavors of boosting. Yeah, but all the ones I know of are on decision yeah. trees. So that's so yeah, it's kind of like I mean, I, I guess that's what conceptually makes sense and or right. works well, and so people have just gone with it. But because decision um, trees have a you know they have a lot of a lot of nice they're a good starting here. point point yeah and uh, kind of have programmatic rules of how to build them, and so then you're just adding something on top of those rules that's. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting to think of because bagging like explicitly means more than just random forest. Like it, you know, it is defined in a way that is more than just uh, trees. You can you can bag any model. Yeah. You can boost any model or like almost at many models <laughs> at least. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, uh, next week, the last chapter on supervised learning. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be interesting. The same way this one was interesting. It's not like a re like really a how to do machine learning chapter, but it's kind of the the statistical background of these models without diving deep into. Right. It doesn't dive deep into the stats, nor does it dive deep into the models. It's just kind of here's the connection point. There you go. You know, and right? I think that's nice to have. All right. Anyone have anything else? If not, I will see everyone on the Slack and see you next week. Thanks, guys. Great info. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.